Gracious and eternal God, we pray in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that you might walk with us in these difficult times as we stand for love, we stand for mercy, and we stand for justice. Whenever you call men and women to preach, you take the risk of putting treasure in an earthen vessel. Now the excellency of the power might be of thee and not of us. Hide us behind the cross, cover us in your blood, fill us with your spirit. Come Holy Spirit, come. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and blessed Redeemer. Amen. To the presiding bishop, the Episcopal Church, Bishop Curry, to Bishop Marianne Buddy, Bishop of the Diocese of Washington, D.C., to Dean Randy Hallerith, Dean of the Cathedral, to the Provost Jane Cope, Provost of the Cathedral, to my dear friend, Right Reverend Kelly Douglas, to my co-chair, the Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, to all of the people who are viewing around the world and around the nation, and to all of you who are part of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, that will be joining for the Poor People's Assembly, Mass Moral March on Washington, D.C. on this coming Saturday, June 20, WWW June 2020 to my brothers and sisters in Black Lives Matters and other bodies that are engaging in prophetic love in the streets throughout this nation. I greet you this morning with Jesus' love, but also with a heavy heart. And I wanna read to you this morning a text from the book of Amos, Amos chapter five beginning at verse 10 in the Message Bible translation. People hate this kind of talk. Raw truth is never popular, but here it is, bluntly spoken. Because you as a nation run roughshod over the poor and take the bread right out of their mouths, you will never move into the luxurious homes you have built. You're never going to drink from the expensive vineyards you have planted in peace. I know precisely the extent of your violations, the enormity of your sins, and they are appalling. As a nation, you bully right living people, taking bribes right and left, and you kick the poor when they are down. Until many are starting to say justice is a lost cause, evil is epidemic, Decent people are throwing up their hands, protest and rebuke some think are useless and a waste of breath. I need somebody that will seek good and not evil and live. You talk about the God of the angel armies being your best friend as a nation. Well, live like it and maybe it will happen. Hate evil and love good and then work it out in the public square. And maybe God, the God of the angel armies, will notice your remnant and be gracious. Now again, my master's message, God of the angel armies says, go out into the streets and lament as loud as you can, cry, weep and wail, fill the malls and the shops with the cries of doom. Weep loudly and declare, not me, not us, not now. Empty the offices, the stores, the factories, the workplaces. Enlist everyone in a general lament, a call for repentance. God says, I want to hear it loud and clear when I make my visit. Now, woe unto all of you who want God's judgment day. At God's coming, we face hard reality, not fantasy, a black cloud with no silver lining. God says, I can't stand your religious meetings. I'm fed up with your conferences, your conventions. I don't want anything more to do with your religion projects, your pretentious slogans and goals. I'm sick of your fundraising schemes, 
your public relations and image makings. I've had all I can take of your noisy ego music. When was the last time you actually sang to me? You know what I want? I want justice, oceans of it. I want fairness, rivers of it. I want justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's all I want, says God. That's all I want. This morning, I want to try to preach America. Accepting death is not an option anymore. Accepting death is not an option anymore. This scripture is the prophet's message from God to a people and a nation who have become too comfortable with other people's death. Over and over again, the prophet says, seek good and not evil and you will live. The logic there is seek evil and not good and you will die. This text declares that the leadership at this time was corrupt and the policies were crushing the poor and the vulnerable. And the prophet always says to the nation, your choices are killing you. Your leadership is killing your people and your possibilities. And if you desire to be the nation God would have you to be, seek good, seek justice, not evil, and live. The prophet Amos is clear that many in the nation and especially its leadership do not want to hear the raw, plain truth. But God says to Amos, you have to share it. There is too much death in the land because systems and people in the political systems are running roughshod over the poor and taking bread right out of their mouths because of greed and political bribery and bullying good people and kicking the poor when they're down, there's too much death in the land. All of these actions God tells Amos to tell the nation are leading to the death of the people and the death of the possibility of the nation. Then the prophet says that this is the kind of injustice that has made some people to feel dead tired, tired of fighting against it to the point that some feel like justice is a lost cause, says the scripture. Evil is epidemic. Decent people are throwing up their hands. And Amos says some even have begun to feel like protest and rebuke are useless and a waste of breath. America needs to hear the ancient wisdom that comes from this prophetic text. It is a text deemed that is honored by Christians, Jews, and Muslims, and many other faiths alike. It is a call for every nation to take inventory of itself and to be clear that accepting unnecessary and unnatural death is no longer an option. The nation should have never accepted it and can surely not accept it anymore. The prophet speaks to make clear that a time of reconstruction, a time of repentance, and a time of reckoning has come. This raw truth needs to be heard in this country we call America because America has a long history of death that brings us to this moment we're in that we've not ever dealt with. When we review this history and match it with the present reality, the Holy Spirit is saying to America, accepting death is not an option anymore. It was here on these shores that the genocide of indigenous tribes began. 
by colonizers before a nation was ever established. Too many people were too comfortable with other people's death. Before America was, too many people in this land looked the other way at the deaths of First Nation and indigenous people. This death was so gruesome that in June of 1864, for instance, Civil War hero Colonel John N. Shivington led a Colorado militia against the Black Kettle Band of Cheyenne and Arapaho, then camped at Sand Creek. They asked the question on a special by PBS called Who is This Savage? described how some regular army officers protested that to attack the peaceable village would betray the army's pledge of safety. Colonel Shivington ignored them and said, damn any man who sympathizes with Indians. He said, kill and scap all of them, big and little, because nits make lice. He ordered the attack when he was not only a colonel, but an ordained minister. America accepting death is no longer an option anymore. Then there was the Atlantic slave trade, race-based chattel slavery, rooted in bad biology that skin color determined worth and brain size, sick sociology that people had to exist in a hierarchy somebody above the other person, evil economics that the means justified the end, and heretical ontology that God intended it and made it like this. And because of this, untold millions died in the ocean between Africa and the Caribbean. And then thousands upon thousands died in the field by the rope and by rape and by gun and even on the run. From the beginning, the death that slavery created was allowed. It was allowed because of compromises, political compromises. That's why I hate them to today. Political compromises with slaveholding states that were written in the Constitution. First, the Constitution gave the South a 20-year reprieve against congressional action to stop the international slave trade. This gave the planters time to consolidate their power. It also ensured that 20 years later, commerce, commerce in black bodies would generate vast profits for domestic breeders. Too much death. Second, the Southern delegates nixed direct national elections fearing that the larger Northern electorate would leave the South without influence on the scores of Negroes. This is how we got our electoral college in the first place. And this compromise allowed this death dealing slavery to continue on. Third, they insisted in the constitution that property in human flesh be counted as three fifths of a person for the purposes of representation in Congress we fractionize people for political means. This said from the beginning that black lives didn't matter because they were a fraction of humanity. And then despite their political power and paternalistic pretensions, the planters feared that their supposedly loyal and devoted black family members might rise up and murder them in their beds. So the Virginians insisted that the Constitution guarantee the South's elaborate system of militias to defend against revolt. Hence the fourth concession, every state had a right to a well-regulated militia and to keep and to bear arms. Hence the second amendment that has allowed all these guns that are now killing black bodies and white bodies and brown bodies. Hence this idea, this very idea that policing was to control a certain population, even if it meant death of that population. And then finally, should the slave enslaved el elude these slaves patrols and escape north, they put into the constitution the fugitive clause, 
required that runaways shall be delivered up on claim of the party to whom such labor or service may do, defining all Americans, whether you agreed with it or not, as slave catchers for the South and the death dealing reality of slavery. All of the death caused by slavery, even the Civil War, never had to be if there had not been a compromise on the equal, equal humanity of all people. America accepting death isn't an option anymore. This is a hard truth about our history, our history that's so marred in death. Industrialization and the abuse of children in factories, not having protection for workers caused so much death. Late in the 18th century, viruses and disease break out. And instead of dealing with the viruses, the Chinese were blamed, which led to deaths that didn't have to be. In 1918, the flu broke out. The flu broke out and the pre president refused to properly acknowledge it. Instead, he tried to blame it on the Spanish people, tried to blame it on them. And his ineptness contributed to the death of 675,000 people. America accepting death isn't an option anymore. Later on, this, another virus hit, dysteria. And instead of dealing with dysteria, the work of many politicians was to blame it on India's, India, people from India. We've had a long history of this. The Irish were charged with bringing cholera to the United States in 1832. Later, the Italians were stigmatized for polio. Tuberculosis was called the Jewish disease. The entire discourse of the 19th and 20th century politics was saturated with attacks on immigrants as diseased intruders to the body politic. Rather than dealing with the death, there was an attempt to blame it. And in the blaming process, it only allowed the death to expand. Lynching at the turn of the century and the refusal to have a law against it allowed black men to be hung on an average of one per day from 1900s until the 1930s. Race riots in cities like Wilmington and Tulsa against black communities and black World War I vets carried out by citizens and sworn officers of the law, sworn officers of the law, and carried out by members of the National Guard created so much death. Post-World War II doctrine of plausible deniability has allowed the U.S. to back and support the death of millions around the world and to sustain so-called the American way of life. The Iraq body count has documented 288,000 deaths in Iraq alone since the U.S. invasion in 2003. Some say more, all of it based on lies that cause death. America accepting death isn't an option anymore. We've tried it and it didn't work. We cannot ignore all of this unnecessary and uncommon death in our national history. We can't ignore it if we're gonna understand this moment because far too often all of this death was accepted by far too many and we still have too much death today. Too many people too comfortable with other people's death. Even before we got to COVID and police violence, there was a DM death measurement in every piece of public policy, every regressive piece of public policy. 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country before COVID, 43% of this nation, 66 million white, 26 million black, but 61% of all black people. And we knew before COVID that 700 people were dying a day from poverty and low wealth, quarter million people a year. Seven people died from vaping and we had congressional hearings, presidential briefings, 700 people dying from poverty and not a word in our political debates, not a hearing, not a briefing. America 
accepting death is not an option anymore. 80 million people in this country without health insurance or underinsured, and thousands die every year because of the denial of health care. Four million people who get up every morning and buy unleaded gas and can't buy unleaded water, and people die from the poison in their water. 53 cents of every discretionary dollar being spent on war and the war economy, and less than 16 cents on infrastructure and health care and education. And if you go down each of these policies, you can measure death. There's a DM, there's a death measurement in every piece of regressive public policy. According to the CDC, black women over 30 are four to five times more likely to die during pregnancy or childbirth compared to white women. This ought not be. According to the data compiled by the APM Research Lab, blacks are 2.4 times as likely to die from COVID-19 than whites, not because they're black, but because of the systemic racism that denies health care and denies clean air and clean water. Blacks make up 13% of the U.S. population, but 25% of the deaths. Over 3,000 deaths annually are attributed to the particulate pollution from coal-fired power plants with poor communities and communities of color bearing the brunt. Blacks are three times more likely to die from particulate air pollution. The percentage of black children suffering from asthma. George Floyd had asthma. The percentage of black children suffering from asthma is nearly double of whites and death rate is 10 times higher. Extreme heat causes more death annually in the U.S. than all the other extreme weather events combined. And the rate of heat-related deaths in African-American communities is 150 to 200 percent greater than that of whites. Too much death. Before COVID-19, Native and Indigenous people, those people that have already been through genocide, their life expectancy was five and a half years less than the national average. The Indian Health Services came out of a treaty obligation to provide health care to tribes in exchange for their land. The people had to give up their land just to get health care. It predates Medicaid and Medicare, but it has always been underfunded. In other words, we stole their land and never gave them what they deserved when they never should have had to give up their land in the first place. And their health care is only funded at 16 cents on the dollar that is required to meet the need of indigenous people. And during COVID, this COVID-19 pandemic, Native and indigenous deaths account for the second highest death rate in the country behind African Americans. And the Navajo Nation has one of the highest death rates, if not the highest per capita death rate. Far too much death. And $8 billion has been allocated under the CARES Act for the, for the 574 legally recognized tribes in this country. And while this is insufficient, given the historic inequities, even worse is that none of these resources have been sent out yet. All of these stats and figures are unnecessary and unfounded and unnatural deaths. During COVID, the negligent response of the government has caused thousands of unfounded, unnecessary deaths. Forcing poor, low-wage workers we now call essential to work without giving them the essentials they needed and they need has caused thousands of unnecessary, untimely deaths passing three rescue bills in Congress that gave trillions of relief to the corporations and the banks. 84% of all the money went to corporations and banks, but no guarantee of health care and living wages and sick leave and adequate un unemployment and moratoriums on water shutoff has caused unnecessary and unnatural death. Columbia University said over 69% of the 115 souls we have lost did not did not have to die. And then the video of George Floyd. See, you can't understand what's going on in the street unless you understand the compounded weight of all this death historically and in real time. And then with all of that, we see the video of George Floyd's lynching by knee, 846, 846, death by racism. Code 666, captured by a 17-year-old girl. And now Rashad Brooks falling asleep in a drive-thru. Huh? Mm. Falling asleep in a drive-thru. Not dead when he fell asleep, but then shot dead through his back by running through the police. 
And when we all heard George Floyd say, I can't breathe, it is as if the democracy itself took a collective gasp and so many people who've seen so much death said, I can't breathe either. I can't breathe called out in compelling shorthand America's enduring systemic racism and poverty that endures the cause death in virtually every measure of well-being, health care, wages, wealth, unemployment, education, housing, policing, criminal justice, water quality, and environmental safety. All realities that also wreak havoc in poor and low wealth white communities because we are all inextricably bound together. I know this is hard stuff, America. It's hard stuff to face about one's own nation. But until we face it, we can't repent right. And that's what Amos was saying to that nation then and what Amos and the Spirit is saying to the America now. Someone must not only say the truth, but somebody has to say no more. Accepting death is an option, isn't an option anymore. The wisdom of God, if you continue to read that text through the prophet, is number one, Amos says, real truth telling, real truth telling, that in this moment we need some real truth telling. Amos said, folk don't like this kind of hard truth, but somebody has to engage in the radical, radical endeavor of telling the truth in a season of lies. If we're gonna get better, we need real truth telling, real truth telling that says, America, you're killing yourself. Every nation must be told when she's killing herself. America must be told, the president must be told, the Congress must be told, governors must be told, even the church must be told. We must be told the deaths in the past didn't have to be. And many of the deaths in the present don't have to be. They are the results of our failure to live up to the creed that all people are created equal. They are the results of systemic injustice. And as James Baldwin insisted, they can be changed. When it comes to structures of our common life, he said, we made this world we're living in and we must make it over again. And we have to tell this hard truth. If we're gonna turn from all this death, we need real truth telling. But not only that, when a nation is facing unnecessary and unnatural death, there must be a response of the people. There must be a refusal to accept easy answers and a refusal to just go along to get along. So Amos says, God says, we need real lamenting. Did you see it there? In the text, God says, I need a remnant that will cry in the street and refuse to be comforted. Uh, we need from the place of deep love, deep love of humanity. We need public tears and public outcry everywhere. Jesus said we need love laborers. Amos said we need real lamenters. Uh, I believe that's what we're seeing today in our streets and it has to keep going, public mourning. Mourning rooted in deep love, mourning rooted in the, the reality that people still believe things don't have to be this way and things can be changed. People saying this is not right. There must be a wailing. There must be a crying out. There must be a refusal to just pass over all this death. The text says, God says, I want everybody to cry. The text says, I want everybody to, to mourn. I want everybody to lament. I want everybody to say something is wrong. And if everybody won't do it, I need a, 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 I need a remnant that'll do it. And will not ever give up. Will not ever accept it as it is. In fact, the text says God will only help us when God hears that we are sick and tired of this injustice. And God doesn't know we're sick and tired of it as a nation. We're sick and tired of all this unnecessary death until he hears a lament, until he hears a cry, until he hears a wailing, until he hears a repenting, a repenting coming up from the street that shuts down the factories and shuts down the, the cities and shuts down the mall. We need lamenting in this nation real lamenting it says we can't have it anymore accepting death is not an option anymore and then thirdly we need real reconstructing real reconstructing we must turn away from death and towards life in every aspect of our life together we must recognizing that death is no longer an option 
means demanding a reconstruction and a reordering of our nation away from death to where we are a nation fully committed to what we declare life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We need real reconstructing of society rooted in the deep moral values of our faith and of the Constitution, facing a society that has had such a lethal history. God, America, you've had such a lethal history. We must face the fact that the history and the character of our nation carved out chasms of racial brutality and economic exploitation, carved them out into the body politic. And because of this, policy tinkering will not heal them. If this nation wants to live, God says through Amos to us 2,600 years later, we must let justice roll down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. That's the answer in the text. That's the answer to living rather than dying. Justice, you see, is life. When policies and actions are rooted in justice, they bring life. Justice is the antithesis of deadly policies. Justice and love wo woven together, that's the answer. That's the antibiotic for all of this death. Dr. King what said justice is the only absolute guarantee against riots. And long before Dr. King, Amos said, don't accept death, but let justice roll down like water. Not parades, not memorial services, not, not a bunch of religious things, but let justice. That's the only way out of this, let justice. In America, I'm here to say the time to stop accepting all this death and let justice roll down like waters is right now. Racism in all forms, healthcare denial in all forms, it's wrong, it's death dealing, and it's now time to let justice roll down like waters. And if we did this, we could live. If we recognize that this virus, for instance, coronavirus, is giving power because what epidemiologists call the wounds and the fissures of our society that come from racism and poverty, that the virus is not that powerful in and of itself, but it's given power because of the wounds created by racism and poverty. And if we recognize that and if Congress would repent and lament and go back and say we messed up in the first three bills, but we're going to pass a fourth bill. And in that fourth bill, it's going to have health care for everybody and living wages for everybody and sick leave for everybody and unemployment for everybody. And everybody's going to have the PPEs that need. And we're going to have rent more forgiveness and, and, and moratoriums on utility shut off. Then we could live. But if we don't fix these fissures, fix these wounds, death is still haunting us. If we, if we, if we decided to love life and see life as more important than power, Life more important than lust. Life more important than hate. If we, if we no longer turn the other way when black folk were killed or, or, or Muslims were killed or Jewish people were killed or trans people were killed or gay people were killed. If we choose life, then we can live if justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. If we instituted fair elections and restricted the influence of big money in our politics, we could transition to automated online voter registration and give life to our democracy. If, 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 if we would pay people a living wage and, and, and we, would, we would immediately remove 49 million people would come up out of poverty and put $328 billion into the economy. And if we implemented a housing wage that says if you, if you ought to at least be able to afford a house if you work, we would raise pay for 83 million workers by more than a trillion dollars. And this would give life to our household and revive our economy. If we ended mass incarceration, we would significantly reduce the 179 billion that currently goes to policing and courts and prison. This would give life to our communities and raise resources to secure housing for all. If we stop pouring money and resources into a border wall, we could move that 24 billion into our children's K through 12 education and give life to their dreams. If we cancel one military contract, we could have $25 billion to expand Medicaid in the 14 states that haven't done it. This would mean life for millions of people in those states who are uninsured. If we canceled a different military contract, we would have more 
more than enough resources to put toward expanding our water infrastructure and creating 945,000 jobs instead of putting those resources in war, we would support life because water is life. If we restructured police departments and, re and redirected resources and demand to protect and serve rather than shoot and kill, we would see life. If we cut $350 billion from the military budget and close some of the 800 bases we have around the world, we would make the world a safer place. And with those resources, could, they could be put toward ensuring health care for all and our democracy could live. If we had put $6.4 trillion that we've poured into endless wars since 9-11, if we had put that money into the green energy, we would have built a renewable energy grid by now with nearly $2 trillion to spare and our planet would live. If we restore the corporate tax rate to what it was before the massive tax cut, our democracy would live, would live, would live. We could raise $130 billion a year. This would be more than enough resources to fund the $100 billion we need to provide early child care and education for every child in this country. This is the way of life. If we just instituted a tiny tax on Wall Street trade, we would raise more than $70 billion we need to invest in free public college for all. If we implemented a wealth tax on the richest households in the country, we could raise $275 billion a year. If we put this toward fixing our public infrastructure, it would create 2.5 million green jobs. If we taxed inherited wealth fairly, we would raise $78 billion a year. This would give life to programs designed to narrow the racial gap. If we decided, if we decided that murder is murder, and that we're not going to cover it up, and that we're not going to politicize it. We're not going to be a nation that addresses the killing of a dog faster than we address the killing of a person. If we would do these things, we would have life. But Amos says, through, as God tells Amos, you got to let justice roll down like water. You can't have a little tweak here and there. You can't have a little reforming over here. You can't pass a moderate bill that gets politicized and weakened down to nothing. No, no, let justice roll down like waters. Let there be a thoroughgoing restructuring towards America. America, why don't you try mercy in your public policy? Why don't you try love? Why don't you try redemption? Why don't you try grace? Why don't you try truth? Why don't, why don't you try that rather than trying revenge? Let justice roll down like waters. This means deeply committed, serious work like a rushing mighty stream that reconstructs everything, opens up new territory. When a rushing stream comes through, Dean, it, it restructures everything. Nothing is the same when rushing water comes through. Rushing water moves everything, moves all the dead stuff, and it brings life with it. And I'm telling you, that's the only way we've had the life we've had in this nation. It looked like slavery's death sentence had the last word, but black and white abolitionists came together with Quakers and radical evangelicals, and they found some allies in Lincoln Republicans, and they freed the slaves who were willing to fight for liberty, and they took the promises of the Constitution and added the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, and it came through like Russian war rushing water and brought life. It looked like the redemption movement and Jim Crow had killed the promises of equal protection under the law, but World War II vets who had fought for democracy in Europe linked up with preachers who knew the prophet Amos and black students and white students started sitting together and Cesar Chavez and Martin Luther King and Rabbi Heschel, they all got together with Rosa Parks and Dorothy Day and they marched together and they built a civil rights campaign and it was the second reconstruction in America and it came through like rushing water. Uh, well, I stopped by today to say it might look like death is winning when we watch a police officer choke the life out of a fellow human on TV or when we see someone shot in the back or when we see white supremacists emboldened by the actions all the way from the top to the top of our government. But through the eyes of Amos, I see something else happening. Look, look with me for a minute at the news. Look for me with the eyes of Amos, with the anointing of Amos. Go with me to a church in eastern Kentucky where I've been, where I've seen white coal miners and black folk from Louisville connecting up with LGBTQ people to say no to the deadliness of racism and classism. Go stand with me as I was a few weeks, months ago, down in the middle 
of the Rio Grande River just for a minute where documented, uh, undocumented folk held a vigil and clergy surrounded them and wouldn't let the border patrol touch them. I saw justice rolling like a mighty stream. Look real close, look real, real close at the protesters in the street and now they're declaring we will not accept death anymore. Look at me at the streams that are coming together, the black and the white and the brown and the gay and the, and, 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 and the straight and the Jews and the Muslims and the Christian. Look at them and look at how long they're staying. Not one day, not two days, but days and weeks they're saying we won't accept this death anymore. Next week, look at me at the streams that are coming together on June 20 to build the broadest coalition of national justice organizations and state grassroots folk, poor people and of all different races, colors and creeds coming together from every state in this nation, lifting up an agenda for a third reconstruction on June 20, 2020. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there's the possibility of the water dust is still flowing. We need real truth. We need real lamenting and we need real reconstructing of this society. If America's ready to say accepting death is not an option anymore, it better be. It better be. And the only way we're going to do it, the only way we're going to move this history of death and continuation of death is to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness, like a mighty stream. I heard a poet say it like this, streams of living justice. Let streams of living justice flow down upon the earth. Give freedom's light to captives. Let all the poor have worth. The hungry hands are pleading. The workers claims their right. The mourners long for laughter. The blinded seek for sight. Make liberty a beacon strike down the iron power abolish ancient vengeance proclaim your people's hour the dreaded disappearance of family and friend the torture and the silence the fear that knows no end the mother with her candle the child who holds a gun the old one nursing hatred all seek release to come each candle burns for freedom each lights a tyrant's fall each flower placed for martyrs gives tongues to silence call for healing of the nation for peace that will not end for love that makes us love us. God grant us, grant us grace to men. Weave our varied gifts together. Knit our lives as they are spun. On your loom of life, enroll us till the thread of life is run. O oh, great weaver of the, our fabric, bind the church and world in one. Dye our texture with your radiance. Let our colors with your, light our colors with your sun. Your city is built for music. We are the stones you seek. Your harmony is light language. We are the words you speak. Our faith we find in service. Our hope in others' dreams. Our love in hand of neighbor. Our homeland brightly gleams. Inscribe our hearts with justice. Your way. Your way. Inscribe our hearts with justice. Your way. Your way. The path. The path. Untried. Let justice. Let justice roll down like waters and we'll live. We'll live. We'll live, we'll live. Decide America, decide this day. Decide that accepting death is not, isn't an option anymore. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And we, we will live. God help us, God help us if we don't. But God bless us, God will bless us. God will bless us if we do.